In this week's installment of Spring Tips, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the Spring Tool Suite. The Spring Tool Suite is our Eclipse-based distribution. It's free it's an, and it's open source, uh, and it bundles a, a few extra utilities uh, on top of the sort of base Eclipse distribution. It is always kept up to date, so if you wait about a week or a couple of weeks, uh, usually uh, after any given Eclipse uh, sort of platform release, you'll find a corresponding uh, a Spring Tool Suite or STS distribution uh, that has all the integrated sort of bug fixes and and uh, that stabilizes all the sort of bits that get released and and then need stabilizing right after any given release train. In addition, the Spring Tool Suite is usually the first place that you'll find uh, support for particular you know Spring uh, technologies. I happen to like the Spring Tool Suite because uh, if you're using Eclipse, it has all these great features uh, above and beyond the the, the the raw Eclipse distribution, uh, and it tends to be on the cutting edge. So, for example, uh, the Groovy support uh, has always been sort of better in the Spring Tool Suite. Indeed, Java 8 support for Eclipse itself uh, was better for you know in the in the time leading up to the Java 8 support, the official Java 8 support uh, in in Eclipse. Uh, so, you know, if you want the latest and greatest features, or if you just want uh, a nice, more uh, a nicer uh, sort of more integrated experience, uh, you know, for example, uh, for a long time. Uh, the Spring tool, tool Suite had Git and Maven support bundled out of the box, whereas for a while the uh, base distribution of Eclipse didn't. Right, so you you had a more reasonable set of uh, of tools. And uh, I I uh, tend to use uh, IntelliJ uh, just because I want people to see that you don't need a particular tool uh, to use um, Spring. But Spring Tool Suite uh, is a very very good, very, very competent, very, very capable, very fast, uh, and constantly improving uh, uh, IDE. So, in this installation, in this tip, we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the really nice features that make the Spring Tool Suite your premier destination for building a uh, Spring-based application. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start up the uh, Spring Tool Suite. I've got the latest and greatest, which is 3.8.2. Uh, if you want to get your own version, if you want to get you know the latest and greatest, you can go to spring.io forward slash tools and you'll be given uh, sort of a tour and uh, uh, an option to download the release that's appropriate for your operating system, uh, which I've done. You know, there, and there are, of course, uh, usually integrations or, or uh, downloads for, for other um, operating systems, and there are uh, tools available via other mechanisms as well. So, uh, you know, you might try Homebrew, for example, the, the pivotal tap uh, for Homebrew will will have it as well, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is we have a new uh, workspace. We're going to create a brand new, the Spring Tip STS workspace uh, workspace here. I'll hit go. And it's going to initialize a brand new work size. Now, there's a few things I can, uh, you know, I can, I can see already when I start the application. First of all, this very use, useful little dashboard which gives me uh, sort of one-touch access to some of the really nice uh, features on the website as well as tools, or rather commands, that work inside the IDE, uh, and we're going to cover some of those in turn. You can also see that the, the sort of the blog is here, right? So you've got content, you've got exploratory content. Uh, we just published uh, this week in spring, for example, so that's there. Uh, if you're trying to learn spring, if you're trying to learn uh, how to use spring, there, um, there can be no better resource, no better uh, sort of place to begin your journey than the guides, right? And the guides on spring.io for slash guides are topical 10 to 15 minute long introductions to all manner of different topics uh, in terms of spring and, and, and spring boot. And, uh, you know, each each guide is very well written and uh, it features uh, code that you can follow along with. And if you want, you can import that code into your, into your IDE and work with it. But it's nice that I can go to file new and uh, import the uh, spring getting started content, right? So here I have a, a, a dialogue, and let's say I wanted to build a JPA application. Like so, I, I click on accessing data JPA. I say I want to use Maven for my build tool instead of Gradle. Um, and uh, I can see that this is the guide that is represented by this URL. So I choose this, and I hit finish. And it's meanwhile, it's, it's going to download the three uh, or the two or three Git repositories, the uh, the complete and the initial uh, Git repository, and it's going to open up the guide. So now I can follow along with these steps in the IDE, right? Um, I can see everything that's required. You know, the the, status, the requirement to start the um, 
guide with the spring tool suite is already satisfied of course we're already into the uh, into the tutorial here the, into the guide we don't have to you know get the code and get content and import it into our ID we're able to just begin the work of defining a single entity right like this so that's very useful and of course if I want to check my work I can always just look at the uh, the complete example here it says source main Java uh, hello etc 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 so you know we've already got a useful working application it compiles a build uh, and of course if you understand all this stuff then maybe you you know maybe you've already done your guide a day and you've uh, you're interested in getting to work there is also uh, the spring initializer so you know if, uh, anybody knows me knows that I love start.spring.io. This is the uh, the Spring Initializer, but the Spring Initializer is also integrated into uh, the Spring Tool Suite. So you can go to you know <clears throat> File New Start uh, Spring Starter Project, and uh, it'll bring up a dialog, which is of course just a facade. It's a front end for the the web service start.spring.io. So I'm going to go ahead and choose to build a a uh, new application. We'll call this the um, what are we going to call this? STS Live Greetings Service, right? Let's just call it STS Greeting Service, and uh, I'll, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll elect to uh, call this um, the STS Greeting Service as well. Let me just copy that. Okay, and we'll hit next. And here I have the same sort of checkboxes that I, I can uh, add to my application. Let's say I want to just add a web application. I want to build a web application, so I'll filter down to the web uh, section, and I'll get the web checkbox that brings in Spring MVC and uh, you know JSON and uh, XML marshaling and multi-part file uploads and you know all that stuff. And of course, all this is going to do is generate a request to the service itself, a, a request that we could then uh, invoke ourselves, you know, manually. Um, but let's just let it do the work for us. It'll download the zip file, unzip it, and then import the resulting project into our ID, which means that we're just able to get started uh, all that much quicker. This application is here. It's just a simple Spring Boot application. And we can open up the code here. And let's say that we wanted to build a simple REST service, just something uh, as trivial as possible. So I'll make this a REST controller. REST controller. Okay, auto import that. It's still importing the dependencies there. Let it catch up. Good. Press controller. And now what I want to do is I want to create an endpoint. I'll say at get mapping high string greet path. Uh, sorry, request param. string hi and I'm just going to return a string so hi hi okay or I can even even better I can rename this just call it name and uh, I need to import this type so I'll just control click on it bring that in control click on this bring that in as well and so there we go. It's a you know it's poorly formatted. So Command Shift F. I'll I'll just reformat the code there. And now I have a simple Spring Boot application. I can run this now. One of my favorite features inside of a uh, Eclipse and in, in the Spring Tool Suite, of course, in particular, uh, is the uh, Quick Access Bar. So Command Three on the Mac opens the Quick Access Bar, and you can drive the entire IDE from uh, from your keyboard, which is very very useful, right? So I'm going to run this particular application. I'm going to run it as a Spring Boot app. And we'll see it spin up here in my local machine. Uh, it's down here in the console, right? So you can see the logs. I can see uh, everything that's happening. It's spun up in port 8080. Now I can imagine wanting to open this up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the browser here, and I'll go to localhost 8080 forward slash hi name equals world. Okay, and there we go. There's the a simple response from our service so that wasn't bad but I can imagine also wanting to to manage data right so let's go ahead and go back to our code here and I'll I'll build a JPA entity so I'm gonna say class um, greeting and I'll say at entity now of course this type doesn't exist on the class path I just chose at the spring initializer I, I selected uh, uh, web but I didn't I didn't choose support for JPA so what I'm gonna say is I want to bring in the Java persistence entity type and you can see that when I mouse over that 
Eclipse is aware that that is transitively imported via the Spring Boot Starter Data JPA starter dependency. So if I select that, it'll automatically add this uh, dependency for me to the uh, Maven build. So it knows that that you know it's reverse sort of uh, uh, resolving that type for me, and uh, it updates itself. And voila, now I've got JPA support. I didn't have to think about it, didn't have to context switch to another file. Uh, I'm able to just get to work. So at generated value, okay, private long ID, private string greeting, okay, import this. Command Shift F to uh, reformat. Okay, so now I've got a simple JPA type. Uh, I need some getters. I need you know I need the normal sort of uh, proformer stuff. So I'm going to generate uh, you know the um, the getters and things like that. The things I need to care about. So generate getters and setters. Choose this. Choose that. Hit OK. I need a constructor. So Let's generate a constructor. Okay. We don't want the uh, ID in there. Just want the um, the uh, greeting option. Okay. And we do want a no argument constructor as well. So we'll say greeting. Good. And now I've got a, a very simple JP entity. I'm going to want to create a repository to manage this. I'll say interface. You know, this is a Spring Data repository. It's going to be declaratively defined for us automatically. We just provide the um, interface definition, and uh, Spring Data will implement it, providing all sorts of CRUD support. So things like find all, save, flush, you know, find by ID, delete, etc. So that's already brought in and, and available for us by virtue of the fact that we have. JP repository, or rather we have Spring Boot started data JP on the class path. But what I also want to do is make this available as a REST API. And, and that makes sense, right? I mean, I could create my own REST API a la this REST controller up here, but that would, you know, I, I'm unnecessarily adding a bit of an indirection. Uh, what I want to do is create an object that uh, does that work for me. And I've already got um, my Spring Data repository, which knows how to do the mutation of that particular entity. So I may as well just let Spring Data REST do the work for me. So again, here again, I want to say repository REST resource. And I can see that that's available via the Spring Boot Starter Data REST type. So I'll go ahead and let Spring Boot bring that type in for me. Add it to the class path. Re you know, it'll refresh its own configuration automatically. And there we go. Now we have a type. Now we have a simple API. And if we, uh, you know, if we restart this, like so, it's in the you know it's saved in the um, uh, you know the run resource uh, dialog. We can see it's a previous option. Now I can restart. Uh, it's going to go ahead and restart. And of course, this has got the ASCII uh, terminal, so you can see color you know color coded output uh, available as well. And it's complaining that we don't have a database. So now I need to add an embedded database. Uh, for this, I can open up the the palm.xml right. So the palm.xml in my STS greeting service. And there's a few ways I can solve this problem. What I want to do is I want to import uh, an H2 database. So it's going to load up the view for, uh, for Maven, you know, palm editing here for the first time. I go to palm.xml, uh, and I can say, let's add a dependency, or insert a dependency. I'm going to say com.h2, and then do a, um, a uh, specify that as a group ID. Choose that as this, and there we go. So now I've got my own Maven dependency there as well. Uh, and if I restart again, we should see that all spin up uh, correctly, right? So very sort of cleanly. I didn't have to bounce around too much uh, between files. It was just sort of Ableton imply what I was trying to do. It knew about the reasonable next steps. It auto-completed not just code in this file, but code in other files. Right? I understood what, what the next step was to make this work uh, based on common usage patterns. So my application seems to have started up on the, uh, uh, on the same port, which means that this is running here as well. We go back and kill it.
Okay. Go back here. Goodbye. And kill again. And now we can rerun it. Okay, there's our application. It's up on port uh, 8080. We can confirm as much by visiting the browser here. So here's the browser. Localhost 8080 forward slash um, greetings. And, uh, you know, we should get nothing here, right? We have no data in the database after all. So there's that. We got the request. We don't want to re it's going to return JSON, which is going to prompt us to download. I'd rather just confirm it so that works there. Uh, we know it's working, right, because it generated a response. It's just not a response that the browser can work with. So we can, of course, open up a browser, or sorry, a terminal. Right, and we get the JSON output. Okay, so we now we have a basic service. Uh, I'd like to take this to the cloud, right? I've got an application. It wasn't hard to build it. I could I learned how to build it first, and then I was able to build it. Um, you, you know, here in Eclipse world, we have the WTP, the Web Tools uh, uh, packages, or uh, I forget what it's called these days, but it's the WTP uh, connectors, right? These connectors are for servers. And sure, it's a Spring Boot application, so if you had chosen in the Spring Initializer, if you had chosen .war, then you could drag this uh, project onto any sort of connector for, for you know, for example, Tomcat or, or Jetty, uh, and that would have worked just fine in the Servers tab here. But yeah, that's not, you know, by and large... Uh, the destination that um, a lot of people care about these days, right? Because Spring Boot has its own embedded web server. So instead, what a lot of people care about is moving these applications uh, seamlessly back and forth in the cloud, right? And so the uh, Spring Tool Suite ships with something called the Boot Dashboard. The Boot Dashboard lets me seamlessly move my applications back and forth, uh, you know, uh, from my local machine to Cloud Foundry, which is an open source platform. So I'm going to go ahead and at a Cloud Foundry target, that is to say, I'm going to go teach my Spring Tool Suite instance about a uh, an instance of Cloud Foundry. I'm going to log in here for the first time, and uh, we'll tell it to target Pivotal Web Services run.pivotal.io. Remember, Cloud Foundry uh, is a open source platform, so there are numerous different implementations of Cloud Foundry running. You can run it on your, your own data center. You can run it in uh, on top of Amazon Web Services, on Google Compute Engine, on vSphere, on OpenStack on uh, Microsoft Azure. I mean, lots of different environments, target environments. So there's no such thing as the one true um, Cloud Foundry. That's why we have to specify the API endpoint for the instance that we want to work with, in this case, api.run.pivotal.io. Once I'm logged in, I have different organizations. These are uh, you know, the, the teams, if you will, that I'm working with, just as you might have different organizations on GitHub. Uh, and then within that, you have spaces. And spaces are um, logical divisions or logical partitions of applications. You might have dev or Q&A or or you know whatever different marketing different departments uh, it really doesn't matter right so I'm going to log into the platform engineering uh, organization uh, and uh, choose the Josh Long space I'll hit finish and hit finish again and that's going to connect you can see it's going to connect here uh, and it's going to sort of draw a, uh, a menu of all the uh, applications already deployed on uh, on Cloud Foundry and as it as it uh, gets metadata, it shows the um, information about the services, so the green arrows are actual Java apps that are running on uh, Cloud Foundry, the gray dots are Java apps, or you know, just apps in general, right, because Cloud Foundry is um, uh, language and, and sort of technology agnostic, uh, these are deployed applications that are not running, and then these are services, managed services, like these are logically named services like databases and message queues and caches and whatever. So what I want to do is I want to take my uh, newly uh, sort of polished uh, greeting service and I want to deploy it onto Cloud Foundry. So I'll add this to uh, this. It says deploying projects. It's now asked me how do I want to, you know, do, do I want to specify an existing manifest file a mani or do I want to have it synthesize one for me? A manifest file is just a, a YAML file that specifies things that the platform needs to effectively run your application. It needs to know a logical name by which to reference it. So in this case, STS greeting service. It needs to know how much RAM uh, you want to allocate. If you want to specify that, you can just leave it alone. It'll give you default value. It wants to know what kind of build pack you want to use. So you can actually provide a logical name like this or a GitHub or rather a Git repository that points to 
a specific implementation of the build pack. Now the build pack uh, is just a it's just a um, directory full of full of scripts that are in well-known locations that the platform will know to run in a sort of sequence based on a life cycle uh, when it's trying to build an environment to run your application. The Java build pack does the right thing to lay down a JDK. It, it, uh, if, it, if it needs to, it'll lay down Tomcat by default. It'll set up a certain amount of memory. It'll set up the class path. It'll do all the things that you need to run a Java application. Um, but there are other build packs, right? So any language you can imagine, there's probably a build pack out there. Uh, and so you know you could specify other ones, or you or you could fork ours. You could fork our custom Java build pack and uh, override it, and then point it point it to that. Okay, so it's automatically given us a default reasonable build pack, or rather reasonable manifest. We can copy that and then save it in our local project as manifest.yaml in the root, um, or we can just leave it as is, and uh, I think we will. So it's now pushing the application up into the cloud alright so the application has spun up on the cloud we can see it's much reflected uh, here in the console uh, now it's uh, you know it's still pushing it's still uh, deploying the application but it looks like our application is there and we can see that it is linked to the local uh, Java project here um, and you know we can do all sorts of interesting things here now that we've got the application running we can uh, for example interrogate the application by clicking on this and um, selecting the manifest we can show properties or you know sort of information about the application uh, <clears throat> as it lives as it uh, is exposed uh, here right uh, in, in our local machine we can see the URL where it's available so we can Clips on, click on that. Goodbye to this. There we go. And uh, it's asking us to download the response. I don't want to do that. I'll just take the um, URL and use that to feed a request. I'll say name equals world again. There we go. There's our, our application uh, running in the cloud. So, you know, this was a very, very easy way to get started and to do interesting things and to see what's happening. The, the boot dashboard is one of my favorite features. Uh, it has more, you know, far more capability. You can actually, for example, put breakpoints here in your Java code. Oops, there we are. So we can put breakpoints uh, in the uh, in the code itself, um, and then debug it, right? So you can, if I choose to um, use the DevTools uh, sort of uh, support, uh, the Spring Boot integration with Cloud Foundry will actually make it so I can um, debug it and then connect to that breakpoint while the application is running in the cloud. So that's very, very convenient. Uh, and if I want to, I can even do, I can use DevTools to uh, automatically re-upload um, or upload, upload content to upload change classes to Cloud Foundry without re restarting the whole thing. So that all plugs in very, very nicely uh, with the existing Spring Boot, Spring Boot uh, you know, MO of increasing productivity, uh, and we now bring that to you uh, for testing in the cloud. I, you know, it is a Spring Boot application, so of course you can run it in local machine. If you're doing everything right, then your your context, the things you need to get a reproducible application, uh, are just environment variables, and you, of course that should run in your local machine. But it is nice if you do have some sort of uh, you know mismatch or some sort of configuration issue, and you're trying to figure out what when, what could have possibly gone wrong. It is nice to be able to put a breakpoint and see the code as it's executing on the Cloud Foundry instance which you get uh, for free here. Now, there's a lot of other features in the Spring Tool Suite. I couldn't possibly uh, hope to cover them all, but I hope this uh, has provided a, a sort of quick introduction to some of my favorite features, or at least what I think is some of, my, some of the more interesting features inside the Spring Tool Suite. Uh, there are, of course, great, uh, there is, of course, uh, great support for uh, other kinds of properties, other kinds of resources. So you can, you get property completion if you open up uh, uh, the property file, so application.properties, right? Click on this. You say control space, and you get you know all the all the things to which Spring Boot will respond. Server.port equals you know eighty or eighty ten for example. So you get a lot of you know you get smart awareness of these different projects. Uh, you get the ability to debug. It integrates naturally with Cloud Foundry. You've got these great dialogues, these services that uh, are out there, but they're in your ID, so you don't have to context switch around. It's you're, you're able to get that get started that much quicker, uh, and of course it 
um, it's fast, right? So this is and it's stable, and we do the best uh, that that I think almost anybody does in integrating and stabilizing, uh, and then adding value adds to the Eclipse distribution for your ease and consumption. With that, uh, thank you very much, and we'll uh, we'll uh, see you around next time.